uh, international organizations and uh, from different countries. And we have an honor to guest uh, the first guest speaker here, His Excellency Mr. Philip Dimitro, who is the uh, EU ambassador to Georgia. You may know his background, he is a doctor of law. He has very interesting uh, experience. Uh, in his career he used to work as a Prime Minister, he used to work as Prime Minister of Bulgaria. Uh, he used to be uh, part of the legislative body uh, of Bulgaria. He was also ambassador of uh, Bulgaria to the United States. And now we we are pleased that uh, Ambassador of EU, Ambassador Mr. Philip Dimitro is in Georgia. And it's a pleasure to have an open lecture on the, the topic. Today's topic will be EU Georgia recent developments. And uh, uh, after the lecture, uh, lecture we will have opportunity to ask the questions on, on the interesting. Uh, Topics you you may uh, you know and with, with this I would like to pass the word to thank you very much which are which are one okay thank you very much uh, Mr Rector ladies and gentlemen I'm extremely pleased to be here with you today for a number of reasons uh, one of them is that uh, I have heard very good things about the reputation of your institution. I've been told that uh, you are the result of a selection process which ranks this university sixth uh, in, in Georgia in its uh, fastidiousness uh, to accept people. So it has been a tough job for you to get in and uh, I definitely respect it. On the other hand, it's a pleasure for me personally because I don't have uh, this, this, uh, a lot of chances to, to talk to students and I love doing it. So here I am and thank you for the invitation. On the other hand, uh, having such a reputation uh, and record, uh, you evidently are uh, very smart and probably know everything that I might talk to you, especially as long as uh, as a diplomat, I'm uh, naturally restricted within uh, some certain frame uh, of uh, um, discussion. So, my idea is to try to be as short as possible and then go into the QA procedure, which uh, seems to be more uh, relaxed and more open. And it will give us uh, more possibility to see what you're indeed interested in, so that I will not be repeating the things you don't care about or you do know far too well to, to, to have them repeated. Then we're talking about the recent developments uh, between Georgia and EU. Uh, of course, there is an expectation to start with Georgia because Georgia is the aspiring part. Uh, however, I think it is uh, important to mention just a few things about the last years which have been very enlightening for us all and for uh, Europeans especially. This last year, go, years ago, under the auspices uh, of world uh, financial and, uh, well, according to some economic crisis. They taught us a few important things which are uh, good to bear in mind. The one of them is that, uh, uh, though beyond doubt, Europe is the most uh, desirable place to live, judging from the desire of people to get into it. It's the largest market in the world uh, and uh, a place which uh, in many respects is uh, exemplary for everybody else. We still have to keep in mind uh, that it is not true that we know all the answers to all the questions and it is not true that we can, like this, solve all problems that occur. And uh, it is good to keep it in mind because sometimes uh, we might get tempted into the position of uh, insisting on things which still have to be revisited and rediscussed. 
Another thing which the recent re years brought to us was uh, a big upheaval in the neighborhood of the European Union. What we started calling colloquially the Arab Spring was practically a process which evidently changed a lot of things in the surrounding area to a direction and in a way which I'm not sure we still can completely define. Mm -hmm. We have seen how people are eager to achieve change. And we have seen how they are doing their best efforts, including risking and sacrificing their lives to achieve uh, something better. And we don't know how much this process has been successful everywhere. And probably last but not least, uh, mm, we have seen that uh, uh, a number of the things that have been taken for granted about the way in which the process of the world economy, of world trade, will develop, is also putting some question in marks to which we don't always seem to have the answer. A good example is the, well, uh, movements up and down of uh, the Chinese economy, which is one of the biggest in the world, and uh, towards which a lot of uh, our expectations are directed one way or another. So all this is a kind of sobering, kind of enlightening, and it reminds us a very important piece of knowledge which we are supposed to have known in the past six or seven thousand years, but we always tend to forget it. And it is that the world is never perfect, what people do is never perfect, and that the absolute success, happiness, perfection, etc., are not the privilege of human beings to attain. In the same time, during these years, uh, Georgia was one of the very few countries which uh, looked like knowing where it is headed. While many other countries were asking themselves the question whether we want this or that, whether we're going this direction or probably something else not quite this, Georgia was uh, giving signals that it is steadily and firmly aimed at one very clear thing, becoming part of the Western world, coming as, closer, as close as possible to the European institutions and uh, to the Euro-Atlantic security system. If we try to make parallels in uh, the world's development, this probably looks mostly like one phenomenon that take part in the 90s, and this was the development of those Eastern European countries, which eventually became members of the EU and NATO. To open up a parenthesis, what was going on in these countries in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, which was by every standard a kind of a revolution, was uh, often disputed from the viewpoint of not having brought any bright new idea to the world. And some people were asking the question, okay, these guys didn't produce any new concept of government, of politics, of uh, development. The answer to this question is yes, absolutely. This is exactly the case. They didn't because they didn't want to. The essence of the Eastern European revolutions, of those transitions, as we call them in a more kind of a polite manner, uh, in the countries which subsequently joined the, the European Union and NATO, the essence of these changes was to become or to come back to, as they would often put it, to the West, of course, join Europe as the natural 
gravitational center and participate in the common security of the Western world, which is NATO. And I would say that, uh, in fact, though there were a lot of academic discussions about the Rose Revolution in Georgia, some people will tend to define it as the first of the so-called color revolutions. I would rather tend to consider it the last of those, typical for Eastern Europe, in which an absolute clarity of the vision and the tendency was present as compared to the others which followed and uh, in which we see that such a clarity was uh, not uh, so much present. Probably because of this, uh, the development of Georgia in the direction of coming, as we love to say, ever closer to Europe and uh, NATO. I'm European ambassador, I don't have the right to talk about NATO, of course, but uh, let us not forget that most of the countries who participate in Europe participate in NATO at the same time, so I inevitably have a, a kind of a outlook on this. Uh, so, uh, one of uh, uh, the, the reasons for becoming uh, so steadily closer and closer was uh, probably this understanding behind the change in uh, Georgia. I will not go into describing few things which you know perfectly well. I will only mention that uh, in the recent years, Georgia reached uh, um, a number of uh, uh, things which uh, are important for its uh, integration into the Western world. First of all, uh, in spite of the crisis, and not without a serious amount of help, I, I was even tempted to say tremendous amount of help, because indeed, uh, what was given to Georgia in the form of support by the European Union, United States, other donors, was something very serious. But uh, in any event, without the efforts of the Georgians, it wouldn't have worked. Because there are many countries who will get aid and uh, the results are not very admirable. Georgia managed to maintain the economic development and financial stability, which helped a lot and which were also very similar to the way in which uh, something like 12 years ago, some of the countries which subsequently joined the European Union and NATO went through their problems. Of course, there are excellent peoples like the Czech Republic, Estonia, but there were also, let's say, more mediocre cases uh, like my country or other surrounding countries which uh, managed. And I think their experience is even more important because, I mean, bright examples uh, always exist, but uh, if you really want to achieve something, you have to know well how it happens where you are not so dramatically bright. And, uh, I mean, the level of, uh, of the economic development, including the difficulties in terms of uh, increasing the, I mean, raising the standard of living of people, of finding work, income, etc., were very similar to what was going on in uh, the countries I mentioned by the very end uh, of the 90s or, or the first years of the 2000s. Naturally, there was a lot of development in the building of uh, the democratic institutions. I hear from time to time, especially recently, things like uh, uh, Somebody has said that democracy vanished from Georgia with the, uh, the Rose Revolution. This is not serious. I mean, I would not advise anybody to academically repeat it. 
Uh, of course, there were tremendous amount of problems, but the, the things which uh, were highly estimated by the European Union were the factor for achieving three things. A, a considerable development in the negotiations about the association agreement. The association agreement, as you know, is a comprehensive, and especially the association agreements of this generation. I mean, in, in a previous life, when I was doing the association agreement of my country to, to Europe, it was uh, much more concise. I mean, they didn't have so many pages, to put it bluntly. Nowadays, uh, we have become uh, more uh, uh, demanding. And, of course, the feeling that uh, there are tests that have to be passed uh, is much stronger. So, in this direction, Georgia has uh, made uh, particular achievements. And uh, in a direction which we usually separate from this, the direction of the DCFTA, you know what DCFTA means? The Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. I tried to find a translation in French, it took me quite a lot of time anyway. Everybody says, now, this is FTA. In fact, it is supposed to be part of the association agreement, but this is uh, the economic compatibility part of it, which means that uh, Georgia has made a very serious step and hopefully will continue and finish it in the recent months in the coming months, I mean, in the field of uh, making its own market. And this means market rules, market regulations, market standards, market uh, behaviors, if you separate them from the rules. If this is possible, so all this uh, practically compatible with uh, the European Union. It is something like, you know, something like the, the uh, train rails. You either can let the train, train go from the one rails to the others and then, then it works, or if you can't, the train can be full of beautiful things, but it will never come. And the third thing which uh, is a matter of uh, recent development is that uh, eventually a dialogue was opened uh, on the issue of visa liberalization, which I guess for people, especially your age, who are eager to travel, is uh, probably one of the most important things. Hopefully, all these things will develop the same way. In uh, uh, the recent uh, month, this has to be mentioned anyway because uh, it is uh, uh, a recent topic too, Georgia made another interesting step, which was uh, connected with um, what I would call the first part of the test of the sustainability of the democratic changes. And this first part of the test was that uh, after the elections, the ruling party accepted defeat, a new party came in power, and this was done in a peaceful and decent manner. The second part of the test is uh, still to be passed. It is about proving that uh, uh, this was not a matter of uh, absent-mindedness on anybody's part, but indeed a deep conviction of all the Georgian society, not only of one party, that this is the way in which can have things have to go in the future. So basically the prospects of the recent developments seem to be good. As uh, we say in Bulgaria, there is always a possibility to, to, to make something good uh, worse. Uh, but I very much hope that uh, Georgia will go further and make things even better. So that uh, this very important three steps, which I mentioned as part of its uh, coming closer to Europe, will be affected much sooner than later and uh, open the way for uh, you when your time comes to run this country and it's uh, in fact coming to make 
the best decisions on how exactly, in what form, it will maintain uh, its uh, not only Western aspirations, but its uh, Western belongingness per se. So here I stop, if you don't mind, uh, and uh, I will be very open for any questions because I guess this will be the more interesting part of the meeting. Thank you. <coughs> The circle was closed. I mean, how do you expand the Russian influence in Moldavia or something? Do we change anything in that direction? I mean, You're talking about the southern flow? Yes. Well, uh, it has been a matter of lots of debates. Actually, there were two main things, which were actually three, in fact. Uh, connected with the energy. The one of them was a atomic power station which was uh, planned to be built uh, for quite some time and which had uh, in my view some particular faults. One of them that uh, practically it created a very high level of uh, dependency on uh, the supply and the taking away of worked out fuel. I mean, when I was Prime Minister, I remember what happened when I was suddenly told that nobody is taking my fuel. And you have to put it somewhere, and it's very active, among other things, so you're in dire straits. Uh, so this was the one thing. The other project was uh, uh, a pipe for uh, oil uh, between Bulgaria and Greece, which was supposed to be bringing uh, also oil from mostly the, the Russian supply to the Black Sea. And the third thing was the uh, sudden flow. So, uh, especially the last government was supposed to discuss these things more or less in a package because they couldn't uh, separate them so easily. Uh, what they did was that they eventually gave up, uh, even though the rather costly, in a rather costly way, the, the project for the atomic power plant, uh, which I mentioned. The uh, oil uh, pipe for both Bulgaria and Greece didn't turn out to be very feasible. And it was what was recently signed uh, was the uh, plan for the future development of this southern flow, something which, as you know, was a matter of uh, strong insistence on the part of a few European countries, including Italy, and uh, which is uh, a matter of uh, supply with gas uh, from Russia of uh, the southern part of Europe pretty much the way in which the northern part is supplied by the northern flow, if you remember this project. People are talking a lot of things now about this. One of them is that it may not be so dramatically necessary. And it is literally these days, yesterday and the day before, there were discussions in different uh, uh, levels uh, in, in the European Union about the feasibility of the shell gas production. The shell gas production is something which can create uh, such an enormous change in the concept of how uh, energy resources are uh, energy sources are used and supplied that I even don't dare talk about this. However, for the time being. This uh, southern flaw is something which uh, does not have much of an alternative because the alternative should pass by Georgia. And uh, from what I see, it is not yet ready. So the sooner anything of the so-called southern corridor works, the diversity of uh, gas supplies will be guaranteed and then probably there will be no much concern with whether there is a southern flow or not because diversity means reasonable approach to the energy source. Until it is not, however, 
again, there will be one single source and this always poses problems. So I guess this was the big dilemma of uh, the government of Bulgaria when they were making the decision. Finally, I think that uh, uh, this is what they could do. I'm not in the position of uh, making statements on the behalf of the Bulgarian government anyway. Do you think that Europe will lose the interest in Georgia if the southern will not work? I wouldn't say so because uh, uh, the interest in Georgia is uh, something very large. <coughs> of course, it is important that Georgia can be a gas transmitting country. And it is important not for the sole fact of the gas being transmitted, but because uh, it creates diversity, because it makes it uh, possible for the consumers to get it not from one only place. This is important indeed. However, there are other important things about Georgia too. The one of them is uh, the fact that Georgia is indeed part of the closest neighborhood of the European Union. And as you know, we're particularly interested in the countries in the neighborhood. And we try to see what may happen there. Of course, it must depend on what happens and what the country does. But imagine what a joy it is for the European Union to be able to say, well, this is the country of the neighborhood which made it. You know, it's a proof for Georgia, but it's a proof for us too. It is not extremely pleasurable to maintain that some principles are valid and should be followed uh, and to see that they, for one reason or another, are not uh, well accepted in some surrounding countries and how good it is when it is done. So, don't bother from that point of view about the interest in Georgia. The interest in Georgia will not cease, but in any event, it is the Georgian part that has to be done too. Thank you. Yes. Greetings, Ambassador. It's yeah. great to see you here. It's been almost two months since the last elections, so and the cabinet has been appointed, and the ministers have started to work. But I was wondering what are some of the top advices that you have? In terms of democratization, further democratization of the country for the new government, as well as I was wondering if you had an opportunity to talk with the losing party, and I was wondering if you have any advices for the national movement. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the One thing I know is that giving advice around is not a very smart thing to do. Uh, but there are some things which are self evident and I'll point to them. Uh, passions are part of human life. Passions include the uh, passionate love, but they also include the passionate uh, uh, unacceptance, <laughs> even hate. We have to face it, I mean, uh, I started today with the fact that it is high time to, to leave aside the arrogance of people who know everything and do everything perfect. So, it was not uh, uh, unexpected that these elections pose uh, certain problems. To be very frank, there are people in this country and outside of it who thought that change by election in Georgia is not possible. I'm happy to say that they were wrong. But this in itself shows the level of expectation. And uh, when the other thing happens, uh, you may expect it will not be 100% smooth. We have had great examples of reasonable behavior, and I hope that they will continue. Uh, 
The one thing which is extremely important for Georgia, and it depends on the ruling party now, is not to create the impression that after all, all the democratic talk was temporary and uh, it is easy to go to the old ways. This will be done if uh, we see a number of things happening now and we, we are in the moment when we see the start of uh, certain uh, um, prosecutions. They are not brought to an end. And we shall see how independent the different parts of uh, the Georgian political governmental establishment are. Because we have heard the prosecutors, not all of them. We have heard some things about the prosecution. We haven't heard the court of law speak yet. And uh, this has been a topic which has been discussed a lot with the previous government. It will probably be discussed with this government too. But let us see what will happen. The thing which will also be very good for Georgia and which depends on the opposition to a large extent. And I say to a large extent, I understand that there can be counter influences that can be damaging. But what will be very good for, for Georgia will be that uh, there will be as strong an opposition as uh, the ruling party is. Uh, strong. The ruling party, of course, will be stronger because it has won elections. But the importance of a strong opposition, meaning of maintaining uh, an alternative to the government in every democratic country, is uh, an issue number one. It is usually with negative effects when the opposition is very weak. And we have seen this for a period of time in Georgia too. It did not bring much good to Georgia. And the third thing, which uh, depends on everybody, but it will be definitely good for Georgia, is uh, to make another step in the understanding of what democracy means. And when I say this, I'm not critical of Georgia saying that the Georgians don't understand what democracy means. No. Uh, in all countries, the participants in the democratic process are driven by motives which are not 100% perfect. And this is one of the most important things to know about democracy. Democracy is not about danger. Democracy is not about perfection. Democracy is not about those people who all the time want to do good. Democracy is about real life, so that in the course of human events we can establish such rules and such practices that make people, even when they do not aim at something good, to eventually bring good to the people. And it happens in a very simple way, which from the very dawn of democracy has been defined as the division of power. Democracy is not about a party or a government feeling happy, and uh, it is. It is about the people feeling somewhat happier and more at ease. Democracy is not about Having the possibility to make decisions easily, easy decisions usually are difficult to implement. It is about going through all the difficulties of a decision-making process to reach something that is sustainable and can be done. For these things, the division of power helps. When we talk about division of power, we usually think in terms of institutions. You know, this one of the most uh, clear examples of division of power is the American Constitution. The President and the, the Congress and the, the Supreme Court. The President can do certain things, but the Congress can stop him. The Congress can pass certain legislation, but the Supreme Court can cut it down. And eventually, there are 
there is a complicated system of how people are appointed, etc., etc. Why? Because when the different institutions are fighting among each other, they open space for the citizen to breathe. Otherwise, the citizen has only to expect that because they are good, they will be good to him. In this case, the citizen can know that if for some reason some institution is after me, I can always uh, expect support from the other because by their nature, they are in certain creative tension or even conflict, why not? The possibility to bear this is uh, the main uh, issue of democracy. And uh, it is usually misunderstood in the first, during the first years. Uh, I think that Georgia has a fantastic ch chance now because what is usually created with a lot of effort to, to formulate the constitutional rules in such a way that to give the possibility of the different power, the different powers to collide in a constitutional framework, of course, is now happening naturally. If you make use of it, it will be great for Georgia. If you don't, I'm sorry. You mentioned a lot of positive issues uh, for the translation and uh, for our view to the Georgians. But I wonder what are the weakest issues, the weakest points we need to develop and improve. And I wanted to hear your recommendation to our weakest points. Among the, the weakest points, I will point out a few. Probably there are some others too. But the one of them is something which uh, we can see now and which we could see with the previous government. And it is uh, the feeling that uh, uh, power should not be challenged. This is what democracy is trying to overcome in its whole history. It doesn't mean that, as I said a few minutes ago, this is not a desire which often occurs with people in power. This is why the democratic countries have developed such a complex system of barriers and checks and balances in order to achieve this. Ten years after the revolutions in uh, the Eastern European countries, at least in some of them, the picture was not dramatically better than it was in Georgia. However, this is a problem. And uh, this problem is something which uh, mm, inevitably has its effect to the extent that ideally things could happen easier and better, but they happen realistically not as easy <coughs> as well. Uh, the second thing is the issue of uh, human rights. Here it is a little bit more difficult to make comparisons because uh, 12 years are 12 years of the development of the world. Now we are talking about uh, gay parades uh, and uh, uh, the rights of uh, gays, lesbian, transsexual, and uh, bisexual. And we talk about this freely. Uh, 20 years ago, a way to attack a political opponent was to try to spread a rumor that be it Václav Havel or me or you name it, is homosexual. So, in 20 years, the world uh, has changed dramatically. It is difficult for me to say in all the other aspects of human rights 
how fair it is to make comparisons. Mm. If you watch movies in which uh, uh, physical uh, disciplinary measures are used uh, in different institutions and compare them to the absolute uh, impossibility of this to happen nowadays in most of the countries of the Western world, you'll see a huge gap. But exactly historically you can put the, the uh, margin, I don't know. But for sure I think that uh, in the level of acceptance of what what we call the brutality in, uh, let's say, Netherlands. Uh, George is uh, behind. Uh, we hear now about uh, disciplinary measures vis-a-vis uh, -vis soldiers or prisoners. But we also see the absolute lack of desire on the part of uh, drivers to stop on a uh, pedestrian uh, sign. Uh, this is something that comes with time. This is something that you have to, to, to make a certain effort to achieve. I wouldn't say that efforts have not been made in Georgia. But as long as you are asking me, is this uh, more on the not yet achieved side, on the false side, yes it is. And especially, I mean, in every country there are cases of uh, abominable behavior. Especially this happens in institutions, psychiatric institutions, prisons, etc. The reaction to them, however, is uh, a reaction which is uh, anytime itself, not only when they show them on the TV. In other words, I wouldn't say that such things do not happen, but once they happen, the intolerance to them has to be institutional and not only a reaction to the TV event. Well, uh, a third thing which unfortunately is uh, very difficult to overcome is this uh, mm, approach to the changes which uh, assumes that uh, everything that happens has to happen uh, in an equal speed for all citizens. And this, in my view, can be sometimes dangerous. Uh, evidently, there is a period of accumulation before the period of distribution comes. And evidently, building up things is important for the future of people. In my country now, which eventually, uh, after a period of uh, hesitation, managed to have a government which decided to finish once and for all the highways in the country and build them indeed. Now started uh, sounding voices which say, well, people don't eat concrete. They don't eat asphalt. So why the hell do we need uh, these highways? Well, we should have thought first about increasing the pensions and then the highways. If you think like this, there will be no increase of pensions whatsoever. So, uh, this tendency is, of course, something which is dangerous, but it may provoke uh, an opposite reaction, which may go to a very harsh uh, neglect of all these uh, kind of demands, which in the long run, can also hamper the process. So, seeking balances is something which uh, is never being uh, approved. People are never happy with, with seeking with, with, with the balances that are found. They usually think that the balance should have been found someplace else, either on the one side or on the other. But searching for such balances is uh, extremely important. And uh, probably one of the big uh, 
things which the European Union has achieved is that at least it looks now like, or it, no, I very much hope that this is the, the, the fact, that we seem to have found the right point of the balance. And evidently, Georgia is not here. Other questions? We talk much about the China balance right now. I wonder, you know, what kind of role does uh, non-governmental organizations play in that check and balance? You know that uh, we are now absolutely infatuated in uh, the issue of uh, what we call civil society. Uh, and this is uh, becoming a recurrent topic in any kind of discussion on any uh, possible issue, which sometimes confuses the issue itself. Is it important to have active participation of citizens in uh, different kinds of affairs? Absolutely. I mean, the activity, the activism of citizens in different forms of non-governmental organization is a guarantee that they will be active politically. However, this is not their political activity. The political activity is membership in parties, going to elections, voting, etc. Is it important when in the process of decision making you face serious problems to try to hear the opinion of different non-governmental institutions? Of course it is. In fact, you have to be completely insane if you want to maintain power completely neglecting the opinion of people who are not connected with the governmental institutions. However, it does not mean that Democracy means that the NGOs will decide and the government will listen. This is absolutely undermining, of course, because representative democracy is about people who have representative functions because they have been elected and nobody elects NGOs, period. Is it uh, reasonable to pay particular attention to the opinion of people who have devoted a good part of their life into studying certain problems, into putting their heart into these problems, etc., etc. Yes, of course. And if you don't do it, you will miss something very important. But, uh, of course, it does not mean that the people who are dealing with some problems outside of government should be treated as a higher category of uh, capacity to deal with these problems as compared to people in government. Absolutely illegitimate. No reason for this. And uh, after all, it is important to understand that there is a dynamics in the NGO. The NGO is not, I mean the participation in the NGO is not like having a chair in church. And uh, going and sitting them forever, there forever. It is dynamic. Some people spend all their life in NGOs. This is their chance. Many other people are part of the non-governmental world, then with a particular government, they're part of government and vice versa. And this is not only possible, it is good. Because, after all, the place where people take responsibility for the fate of the country and for the fate of their fellow citizens is in government, not in the NGOs. So, why not people who want to take this responsibility be given the chance? And, naturally, when you have been stripped of this responsibility, why not put your capacity, your effort, your knowledge, your expertise in the efforts of the NGOs. What I'm afraid of is that because these things are not clarified, we human beings tend to repeat mantras. 
we have started to repeat the mantra of civil society and then there is a kind of a feeling that it is a bunch of good people, the ones in civil society, a bunch of bad people in government, and we should spend all our efforts to make the good people overcome the bad people over there. Oh my God. Thank you. Maybe last question. We're running out of time. I have a request. Why don't the European Union simplify the project application form? Mm. I wish I could answer you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the uh, uh, European Union is a very complex system because uh, we have put a tremendous amount of effort into guaranteeing fairness. I mean, in, in normal life, a lot of things happen in a more simple way. But when you are, can, are considered the best of the best, and uh, to be frank, this is the truth. I mean, people ask Europe, Europe doesn't ask many other entities for help. The projects are because Europe will pay money, not because somebody will pay to Europe. It's like that. And this is why you need to be fair. Because if there is so much competition, it's like in the university entering exams. I mean, if there is so much competition, and so many people want to reach there, you have to take all the necessary precautions that you will not be accused of selective attitude. Or at least to be accused to the least, or when there is a need of selectiveness to try to introduce it into the rules. And I can tell you this uh, leads to a lot of innovations that make life difficult. But I think this is inevitable. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we have a series of uh, public lectures. I'd like to have a short announcement. Next week, on 26th of November at 5 p.m., we have a guest. Uh, next guest will be UN uh, resident coordinator and uh, resident representative of UNDP, His Excellency Mr. Mark Koldrick. Uh, detailed uh, announcement will follow up uh, shortly on the topic, I mean topic and uh, some other organizational issues. And uh, finally, I, I, I would like to also I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, and especially the Free University Felicity Center of Policy Analysis uh, for organizing uh, such nice uh, event. I'd like to thank you, everyone, for coming and uh, this, for coming to this uh, lecture. And, uh, Definitely, I'd like to say a lot of thanks to our guest speaker, to His Excellency Mr. Philippe for coming and sharing his views and ideas uh, regarding Georgia and EU prospects. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for